In the world of academia, professors are known to go on sabbatical, a sponsored break of sorts that's meant as both an opportunity for rest and to conduct some new research, a way to let the engine cool off from the exhausting grind of teaching people all the damn time. And although I am not a university professor, I am overworked, so I thought it'd be a lovely idea to take January of 2021 as my sabbatical. I'd take a bag full of history books and jet across to Italy, whereupon I'd spend my days drinking Aperol spritz while reading in the piazzas of some of my favorite cities. And yet... Here I am, conspicuously not in Italy, but still deeply tired from the year we all just had and ever more so in need of a break than I could have conceivably imagined in the merry days of 2018 when I first planned that trip. So, here's what we're gonna do. I am going to tell you some fun, dumb stories about Italy, we are going to have a grand old time, and then I am gonna go take a week-long nap. Sound good? Great, let's do some low-effort history. My trip would have started, of course, in Venice. Ah, good old Vembus. Historically renowned for streets made of water, domes made of gold, the trans-Mediterranean slave trade, exploitative mercantile practices, and the one time in 1204 when they did war crimes. You know, it's awful tough to wind up in possession of so many treasured Byzantine artifacts by just asking politely and respecting boundaries, and indeed, by both thievery and regular old copy-pasting, Venice became quite a pretty place. Shame it's so damp nowadays. Although Venice is, in the grand scheme of things, still somehow less problematic than some other famous players, it's always good to separate the nice from the yikes. Historical faves are all well and fine until we start seeing them as flawless, or if we shove our heads so far up our own asses that we pretend some of those flaws were actually features. All historical faves have faults. Yes, also that one. I, I know, they, they made such good art, but look, we've had some time to reflect. We can be better than them now. Sorry, that had been simmering for a while and I needed to get it out. Anyway, when I'm not gushing about Venice's uninterrupted 11th century string of being a republic, I like to stop and appreciate the city's architecture. As a consequence of how early Venetians were basically creating a city on stilts, buildings had to be constructed carefully. With a strong base of waterproof Istrian marble and lightweight brick walls with generous cutout space for windows. Since Venetians were the best glassmakers in Europe, they had the skills and materials to actually make windows that big. Venice was also unique in being at the crossroads of three distinct architectures textural styles. Starting as part of the Byzantine Empire, they soon picked up elements of mainland European Gothic and Mediterranean Islamic design. So even before the Renaissance was a twinkle in Titian's eye, Venice had built itself a gorgeous mix of three already baller architecture styles. And it's a complete product of circumstance. No other city on earth had the opportunities and constraints that would result in a style like Venetian Gothic. Which is a polite way to say no other city could fall so spectacularly ass backwards into artistic success. In the century after Filippo Ultra Diva Brunelleschi accidentally rediscovered classical architecture basically out of spite, Venice was catching on to this whole white marble frilly column vibe. And luckily for the construction industry, Venice was also constantly catching fire, so there were always opportunities to build the newest and shiniest looks. I had written up this whole side tangent about how Andrea Palladio essentially codified the genre of neoclassicism, but... I cut it, because it was long, and probably only interesting to me. So before I start gossiping about the time Palladio almost won the design competition for the new Rialto Bridge, but then they gave the commission to this misaligned doofus instead, let's just, you, let's move on. Midway along the journey of my vacation, that's a Dante reference for you. I was set to take a stop over in Bologna, home to both Europe's oldest university and this one really good lasagna place I ate at like nine years ago. Most tours will focus on the university, but I wanted you to be aware of both. Bologna is a bit of a geographical anomaly within Italy, being right at the eastern edge of the Apennine Mountains and directly in grabbing range for Milan, Florence, and the Papal States. For most of the Middle Ages, Bologna was able to dodge and weave its way to functional independence, but from the 1500s it was quite firmly under the Roman thumb. In 1572, Bologna native Pope Gregory XIII became, uh, <laughs> Pope, <laughs> not quite sure where that sentence was going, uh, and to celebrate, they made him a nice fancy bronze statue in 1580. You can see it here, for it is fancy and bronze. But curiously, the inscription at the top says words that very clearly do not include Gregory, 13, or Pope. So one might ask, what gives? And I answer, dear viewer, Napoleon gives. Usually he is giving cannonballs at speed. But before we can connect boy band Bonaparte to this mismatched inscription, we need to take a second to appreciate the fact that, throughout history, no one knows what people look like. Most citizens would only know their king or queen by the faces struck on coins, which archaeology informs us often looked more than a little smushy. Sometimes we get more substantive depictions, but in the case of the Byzantines, doesn't stop them from still looking identical. But aha, ancient Rome gave us lifelike statues. However, I wouldn't say that even these always 
always made for accurate depictions of historical characters because some statues of Julius Caesar don't look so hot. Where did they hide his cheekbones? And notably, the sequestrian statue of Emperor Marcus Aurelius only survived because it got mistaken for Constantine. My dudes, Constantine didn't even have a beard, we think. <laughs> I mean, good work messing that one up. It's a baller statue. I'm glad you didn't melt it down. And I, I say all this to illustrate my point that the wool is easily pulled over one's eyes when it comes to who is being depicted, even with a statue. So in 1796, General Napoleon and friends were having a grand old time on campaign in Italy and came through Bologna. Now, Napoleon was super not a fan of the Pope, so the citizens thought the statue was a goner. But if maybe it wasn't a statue of the Pope, no big deal, right? So a few artisans got to work replacing the papal tiara with a bishop's mitre and sculpted a bishop's staff to put in his hand, and carved a new inscription that identified this gentleman as Saint Petronius, the fifth century bishop of Bologna and their patron saint. And and far be it from me to question raw genius at work, it did the trick. I mean, sure, Bologna got placed under France's new imperial nonsense, but they kept the statue and restored it to original form a century later. Good thing Napoleon never found out that the big statue of Neptune literally right next door is an allegory for Pope Pius IV. Whoopsies, let's move on. The last and longest leg of my trip would have been spent in and around Florence, because ever since I first played Assassin's Creed II, I've known what I'm about. And as we've already taken an appropriately thorough look at the shiny architecture I love so much, Exhibit A, Dome, I want to take a second to appreciate the Uffizi Gallery. The museum was originally built as an office complex for the Medici Grand Dukes adjacent to the Piazza della Signoria, and it connects to their palace on the other side of the Arno River via a wonderfully scenic corridor atop the Ponte Vecchio. So scenic, in fact, that Hitler categorically refused to bomb it during the Axis withdrawal from Italy because he loved the view. All the other bridges got blasted to bits, but not his dear Vasari Corridor. And so, even for all its legendary power, Der Ubermensch simply could not escape and enslavement to the aesthetic. Shame. As for the Uffizi itself, the Medici Grand Dukes had used part of it to house their private art collections, open to special guests early on, and opening up to the public in 1769. Nice. And the museum maintains the feeling of being a Florentine's collection of Florentine art. It takes you chronologically through high medieval art and then shows you how the different movements of the Renaissance and Baroque periods unfolded in Florence, with some Roman statuary for nice contrast. Florence is obviously somewhat rare in its ability to fill an entire museum with what's essentially a neighborhood talent show, but I quite appreciate that it's not loaded with ill-gotten treasures from far-off lands. Oh, you know, that old trick where museums rake in loot from the colonies and such and just pretend like it belongs to them, resulting in such geographic anomalies as the Rosetta Stone landing in London or the curious case of the Code of Hammurabi in Paris. Big swerve to say that art belongs to the world and then get touchy when the world asks for it back. All that said, the Uffizi's lack of loot might not be for lack of trying, because if Mussolini's dream of rebuilding the Roman Empire was slightly less detached from reality, maybe Italian museums would be stuffed with artifacts that super don't belong there. But Mussolini boofed it thanks to none other than <coughs> Mussolini, so we get to enjoy the pretty painting guilt-free. Or at least we would if I were... yeah. <sighs> okay, happy thoughts, happy thoughts. So, this has been my attempts to substitute a vacation with thematically relevant work, and I'm honestly quite pleased, albeit a little surprised I somehow veered onto fascism twice, and while memes are no substitute for an authentic Tuscan meal, I still had fun, so I'm calling it a win. I know it's been hard to step back and attempt to breathe amid our collective inability to take a step back to anywhere, but I hope the work we do on this channel can be of some assistance or just some relief. Now, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to get back to writing The Venetian Republic, more angry letters about how they built the wrong bridge. Thank you for watching. In continuing to trick my brain into thinking we're on holiday, I'm going to take it easy, watch some episodes of Rick Steves Europe, and bop around in Assassin's Creed 2. As always, a special thanks to all of our patrons for supporting the work we do, and I will see you next time.